Okay, welcome back. Uh, sorry for starting late. I'm blaming Stefan for not keeping an eye on the time. Uh, so, uh, quickly go on to the next talk, uh, improving your Gradle builds. So this is uh, assuming that you are interested in using Gradle or investigating Gradle, um, but want to learn how best to use it, how to avoid pitfalls and the like. Uh, because a common refrain uh, in people that are critical of Gradle is, uh, well, Gradle is like a cutthroat razor. You can cut yourself with it. Uh, Sweeney Todd, famous barber of London, uh, used to cut the throats of some of his uh, clientele. Uh, would then chop them up, and uh, a, his, uh, I can't remember, his, his uh, landlady, possibly, would then make meat pies, very popular meat pies, out of the result. So that's Sweeney Todd for you. He used the cutthroat razor. This is why we have safety razors. They do the same job, but you're less likely to shred your throat and other parts of your face. <coughs> um, so I'm definitely on this camp here. I would never use a, a, a cutthroat razor. And the idea is that uh, Gradle, because it is code, your build file is code, that leads to spaghetti builds. Okay? Which, to be fair, is a fair criticism. It is that much easier to, uh, like any software project, you can end up with spaghetti confusion all over the place. But is this a suitable analogy? Because in the end, both of these do pretty much the same job. One cuts slightly closer than the other, and one cuts more safely than the other. But really, when you're talking about build tools and building software, you need to think more like a workman who needs to be able to do all sorts of different jobs. Even if, they only, even if they're like a house builder, houses themselves are for the same thing. They provide people shelter, but they have uh, different types of bathrooms, different types of kitchen. Uh, they're built differently depending on when they were built or uh, whether they need to be energy efficient, all these things. So a workman always needs a selection of tools and sometimes they need dangerous tools, you know, big power drills, so they can work quickly and efficiently. Yes, you can hurt yourself, that's why you learn how to use them and you're careful with them. You don't give someone a plastic hammer and a plastic spanner and expect them to do the job. Okay? So, building software. There are different requirements. It's, you can't just go for the safe option because then you effectively uh, handcuff yourself. You're, you're giving yourself less flexibility. And so, yes, you can create spaghetti builds, but a bad workman, I don't know if you have a similar phrase in French. Uh, yeah, so English, American, and British English, bad workman blames his tools. But yes, let's go back to this point. You can create spaghetti builds. How do you avoid that? How do you create maintainable builds? Ones that are easy to modify, ones that are easy to update, ones that are easy to understand. So uh, this could probably be a three hour talk, but I'm going to touch on uh, a few of the important topics. The first thing you need to do is understand Gradle's model. Because if you don't understand that, then all the stuff that you're going to do, it's like coding against uh, an API or coding Java without really understanding Java. <coughs> you may even have seen code like that. It's a mess, hard to understand. You, you can't do it properly unless you understand what you're using in the first place. Gradle is fairly distinct in that it's actually an API. When you write a build file, you're effectively writing a program against that API. Uh, and the most common parts of it are this thing called a project. 
And this project sits, when you have a build file, that represents the project. The top level object is a project instance. And a project can have tasks. We've talked about tasks in the previous talk. Uh, configuration. Uh, this is a way of collecting or naming collections of dependencies. You will know them as uh, Maven scopes, possibly. Compile, test, runtime. Uh, but why limit yourself to just those? You can have any number of these with any name you like. Uh, we have the concept of repositories which host dependencies. And specifically for Java, we have a concept of source sets. So this is actually one of the uh, best parts of Gradle's Java build support is this thing called a source set. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so um, all of these are effectively classes and interfaces. Actually, these are interfaces. If you go to the Gradle user guide, there are the API docs and the DSL reference. Both will give you links to these. And you can access instances of these objects from your build file. And once you understand how they interrelate, you will be able to properly use the API and develop good builds. So even with a basic Java build, you're already using aspects of the API. The plugin itself is doing a lot of things behind the scenes. It's creating the tasks, compile Java source files. Uh, package them as a jar file. All of these things are provided there. But even in this, we have a repository. So jcenter is actually a method which creates a repository instance. Uh, we can, the, the dependencies create dependency objects. I can refer to tasks by name. So the Java plugin creates a compiled Java task and we can treat it as a variable. It's an object, so I can access the properties and the methods of that object within my build file. Okay? So that's what I mean by it being an API and programming against it. Uh, by the way, incremental compilation is an incubating feature. Uh, it speeds up your Java builds considerably. Uh, I think it's definitely worth using if you choose to go with Gradle for your Java builds. Um, the reason it's incubating and it's fairly new is because uh, the guys, the Gradle team, didn't want to take the Ant and Maven approach because they said it was broken. Because you would still have to run clean because it would get things wrong. So uh, they want to make sure that this works fully. You never have to run clean just to fix your build. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, you can access all of these things. Within your build file, there is a project property, and from there, you can pretty much access anything you like. Uh, but particularly tasks, you can get all the tasks in your build, the configurations, the positive dependencies, and the source sets. So that's the first stage understanding what the model is, how to interact with it. So that DSL reference and the API documentation are an important part of developing Gradle builds. Those are like the domain objects, if you like. Uh, there is also some extra concepts that are part of the model that aren't actually domain objects. But uh, the first is these, this idea of phases. So when you run the build file, it will go through. You know, it's parsed, it's actually compiled and uh, executed. But the first thing that happens is initialization. Now this, you generally don't need to worry about. It's there, it only executes really for multi-project builds. Uh, that's something I didn't mention. Gradle has multi-project build support built in. Okay, very powerful. Uh, and fairly straightforward to set up as well. Then, you have a configuration phase. This is 
what we're doing here, we are configuring this task. Okay? We're not actually executing the task at that point in time. So once you've got uh, everything configured, configuration builds this task graph, which I'll show you next, and then you get the execution. So three distinct phases. And it's important to understand that when you put some code in the build file, you have to know and understand which phase it's executing in because it behaves very differently. Some things are available in configuration, other things are not. So you need to be, become aware of that. And then at execution time, that task graph that uh, Gradle built up during at the end of the configuration phase, <coughs> it determines what order all those tasks should execute in, and then it goes and does them. Okay? So you go from a graph to a linear order of tasks. So that is the basic Gradle model. It's not that scary, really. Uh, and once you, I, I struggled a little bit with Gradle uh, until I went to a Gradle course. And uh, it was with Hans Doctor, who's the father of Gradle. And he mentioned this idea of a configuration phase. And suddenly, lots of things started to click. A lot of things made sense. And then it became much easier to develop builds. So just having that knowledge of what the model consists of is crucial to having a, a nice life. OK, so advice. First thing, beware of this configuration phase. OK? Because at the moment, it always happens. Everything that you write that goes into configuration will execute. It doesn't matter whether the corresponding task is in the task uh, execution order or not. It doesn't matter. Always executes. So if you have any expensive configuration, every target, every task is going to be slow to run. Even running Gradle tasks to list what you can run will be slow because that uses the configuration phase. So currently avoid expensive work if you can. Um, one way to find out where your uh, build is slow is using a simple profile option. And that will generate a HTML report for you which will break down like uh, how much time is spent during configuration. Uh, if you look in this tab, it will show you how long each individual task took to execute. So you get a fairly fine-grained view of what's using up all your time. Okay? So, I was, I was trying to think of an example. I couldn't think of a really good one. Uh, but here we have uh, Java plugin again. That has a jar task that we can execute. And I'm using a special syntax for batch configuring the jar task. I can put multiple entries in here to configure the jar. Um, and in this, I am calling a build server. I'm sending a, an HTTP request to give me, say, a build number. If your network becomes slow, this is likely to be slow. If your connection drops, this will become very slow until it times out. The problem is, that will happen every time you run Gradle Task, Gradle Compile Java, Gradle Test, whatever. It doesn't matter whether JAR executes or not. Um, and it's for this reason, uh, is anyone using the uh, Gradle Android build? Okay, does it seem slow to you? I'm putting you on a spot here, sorry. Acceptable, great, okay, cool. Um, there have been complaints that uh, Android builds tend to be slow, uh, especially compared to standard Java ones. It's because of this. There's a lot of stuff happening during the configuration phase. And it can't be avoided uh, no matter what you're running. 
So they are working very hard. Uh, they're starting to see results. I saw a tweet from one of the Gradleware developers, Luke Daly, which said uh, he had got a <coughs> 10 times performance improvement on one of his builds from the work they've been doing on this. So effectively, configuration will be done on demand. It will only happen for tasks that you will be running. Yeah? That's something, that's something I don't understand. That is, why would it run the configuration of each task if it's not actually summoned? You said that even when you right. want to list all the tasks, it will run the configuration. So it's a uh, well, complex thing. <coughs> It uses the configuration phase to determine which tasks need to run. In order to do that, it needs to configure every task in the build. Um, so that's why, it, even if your task doesn't end up in this graph, or actually in the execution order, the configuration will happen. Yes? Does that answer? Yeah, you were talking also about uh, tasks that would just list all Oh, Gradle tasks. Yeah. Because it basically builds this. Okay. So when you run Gradle tasks, tasks in the graph. yeah, it, it, um, it, it, the thing is, it probably doesn't need to do that, but that is the way that it was coded. Uh, but it, it can, uh, if you do Gradle tasks all, it will actually show some level of uh, indentation and dependency. And you only find out about the dependencies if you build the task graph and go through configuration. So uh, it's taken him, uh, he's been working on it solidly for six months. So it was not an easy problem to solve. Uh, so I'm looking forward to this very much. And I'm interested to see how it impacts my builds. But Java builds in Gradle typically uh, are pretty fast, unless you're doing expensive stuff within the tasks themselves. Uh, <coughs> so, <coughs> this is, if you're familiar with uh, task definitions, this left shift says, this is a task implementation. This is some work that is to be done. Okay? Whereas, if you go without the left shift, all of this is configuration. The jar task has an archive path property, which I'm setting to some value, uh, a, a property that comes from uh, an external file, perhaps, or another part of the build. And then the actual execution is added by a do last method there. Okay, so this one has both execution and configuration. This is just execution. So if you add that line into that, you're not going to get the behavior you expect. Okay? So that's why I said earlier, you need to understand where your lines of code are actually executing. Are they in configuration or are they in execution? Uh, one thing to think about, consider always using the syntax. Just don't use that. If you always use this, there's no confusion. That's clear, it's execution. That's clear, it's configuration. You don't have to watch out for, oh, is that a left shift there or not? If you miss it, you miss it. Um, OK, so I'm sure everyone's familiar with project properties, uh, ways of parameterizing your build, uh, whether it's uh, specifying a different environment to build for, uh, or you know, providing the version from outside, from the continuous integration server, or whatever. Um, the thing you need to understand about project properties is this. They are effectively global variables. And you run into these same sorts of issues with them. But if you are going to use them, it's nice to provide some sensible defaults so that somebody can download your source code, run the build, and it does something useful. That's what sensible defaults are for. It's for the people, the people who know the build can change the values. Uh, and one final thing, it's not because you are writing Groovy within a build file, 
it's easy to think of properties as uh, they can be any value. They can be numbers, they can be dates, they can be strings as well. Um, but you can override them from the command line. You can provide them in a properties file. What's common between those two? They're strings. So always assume that project properties have string values. Uh, <coughs> so it's a little bit ugly at the moment, but if you want to provide a default value for a project property, that's what we're doing here. You have to do it within the namespace ext, extra or extension or something. Uh, the project property is jar file name, and we use this has property method to see whether it's been defined, i.e. whether it's been passed on the command line via the minus p option, or it's in the gradle.properties file in the same directory. Uh, if it does exist, we use it, that value, otherwise we use our sensible default. Um, that's kind of noisy for something that should be a lot simpler. There is an issue, a Jira issue for this, uh, but it's been there for a few years, I think. Uh, I'm sure they'll get round to it eventually. Uh, not a high priority, I'm guessing. So uh, that's the, the default values. Uh, and then we can reference the project property anywhere from within tasks. So like jar file name in there. <coughs> uh, but we want to be a little bit careful. Let's say that we now want to add a delete task, a clean task, that can remove the, the jar file created by custom jar. Okay? You may think of doing this. Custom clean, type delete, I'm going to use my jar file name project property. Well, this runs into the usual problem of global variables. If I, change, if I suddenly hard code this, or change it to use something else, a different project property, uh, anything, this will stop working. Because there's a disconnect between the archive path created from custom jar and this. So we don't do that. We prefer using task properties. The jar task has an archive path property. Use it. So we say delete that particular file. So make sure that project properties, uh, you minimize the use of them. If you don't need a project property, don't introduce it. If you need it to parameterize the build, make sure that Basically, uh, it's used once near the, the front part of the build, you know, when the build first starts. And then use task properties from then on. Make sure that the, the uh, project property doesn't wean its way into all the parts of your build. Very confusing. That's one definition of spaghetti builds. Okay, so that's project properties and configuration. Uh, refactoring, yes, you've heard that. We're recommended to perform refactoring in our software projects. Well, you know what? It goes for your builds as well. Your builds are living pieces of software. Requirements change. Your knowledge changes. Um, you will want, you need to make sure that your bill is always kept up to date with those changes. Uh, so, you know, consider you may want to just add a quick task to your build file and run it. So I've added a, like, do it with the left shift here. That's fine, but you don't want to keep it like that. Tasks of that sort are not very maintainable. They're very hard to parameterize. How do you add a property to this task? What's well, a task instance? It's not actually a task type. So it's that much harder to add a property. So you're better off, uh, as soon as you can, make sure your custom tasks become task types. So define a class, give it a class name, extend Gradle's default task. 
Or if you're doing something specific, you can extend abstract copy task if you're copying files, if your task does some copying. Um, you can extend any task that you like. It is more verbose, easier to maintain. Um, and then, once you've done that, it's very easy to migrate it into different levels of reusability. So, you do it quick and dirty, you define the class in your build.gradle. That's great, that's fine, but you can't then use it elsewhere. Um, and it makes your build file quite long. And if you've got lots of custom tasks, very long, very messy. So then you can move it into build src directory, which is basically, uh, oh, this is wrong. This is src slash main slash groovy. It's just a groovy project, which is basically a Java project that supports groovy files. <laughs> Same structure. Uh, everything in there, this will be built first. All the class files are then added to the class path of the build file. So uh, I can still do this because my task will be added to the class path automatically. And ultimately, you could then, to truly make it reusable, move the task into a jar file, which you can treat as a normal jar file, or you can make it a Gradle plugin if you want to add a few more features. And when you're actually developing tasks, think IOC, inversion of control, just as with uh, Spring and CPA, no, CDI, thank you. CDI. Uh, you can tell I worked for Spring. Um, so, don't do things like this, where we are grabbing a project property from outside the task definition. It's very hard to now move this task anywhere else into a different build. So, instead, Make sure that you leave your properties empty. A default value is okay, like an empty string or a zero or a number, but don't pull anything from outside the task, from the, the project. Um, and then always configure within the build file when you instantiate the task. Okay? <coughs> yeah. So prefer injection. And the last item of potential refactoring, <coughs> breaking a project into multiple projects. Um, Gradle, again, I think Maven kind of forces you to break into projects before you're necessarily ready, or even if you don't really need to, because it has this requirement that one POM equates to one artifact, one jar file. Uh, but I worked on a project recently where the one build file built a server application and a bunch of client jar files, APR jar files. And you could all do all of that from within one build file using something called source sets. Um, but ultimately, you probably want to refactor that into uh, a server project a client project, and maybe a separate API project. That's the most common example in a lot of um, uh, talks and the like. <coughs> you can also, uh, I don't mention it here, you can break the build file itself into smaller build files to make sure you keep them small. And then where you saw apply plugin, you can apply it from and then specify a .gradle file. Okay? And then you can say, okay, I have a, uh, a static analysis Gradle file, I have a compilation Gradle file, I have a packaging Gradle file. That's when you end up with fairly large builds and you really just want to uh, shrink it to make it easier to grok, to understand and process. Okay, so another important part of developing maintainable builds, actually understand what you're trying to do and what you need to do, what you're trying to achieve. Um, so, for example, uh, understand whether 
your build process is implying a dependency or just has a required order. And I mentioned this one earlier. It's when you have uh, functional tests. Do functional tests depend on you running the unit tests? Well, actually, it's up to you. Uh, in my projects, typically, no. They need the compiled classes, but they don't need the unit tests to run first. <coughs> However, I do want to make sure that when both of them run, like when I'm doing a full build, package, deploy, I want to make sure the unit tests run first because they're quicker, and if they fail, the build fails. And if they're going to fail, the functional tests are probably going to fail as well. Okay? So, that's one idea. Make sure that you are understanding the difference between task order and task dependencies. Uh, make sure you understand how your project is structured. Um, sometimes you want to compile uh, source code separately. You want to give it a different identity. So that project I was talking about, it had server classes and it had client API classes. And in fact, the API classes broke down into modules. So there were like 10 of them or, or something like that. Uh, one thing you might be tempted to do is manually set up the various tasks that you need. The compilation tasks, the testing tasks, the jarring tasks. But you don't have to. This is actually a really ugly way of solving that particular problem. If you have logically different sets of source files, i.e. they have distinct sets of dependencies, uh, they are potentially packaged distinctly, uh, then you can start using the concept of source sets. So now instead of configuring tasks, I just use the Gradle model to say I have a client source set. So my main source set, the implicit one, is my server application, but I have a whole set of other files under SRC main Java which are just for the client and they have different dependencies. And I just specify find them and which of those files match the pattern. Now, I don't really, in this, I wouldn't recommend doing this. This is really asking to be split into a separate project. But uh, there are very useful cases for adding your own source sets. And in this case, it gives you a stepping stone for migrating the build. In this case, we were migrating from Ant, and this is what Ant was doing. So we can introduce this into Gradle keep it similar to the old build, we can refactor into multiple projects later. And this gives us other configurations that we can attach dependencies to. Client compile, client runtime, and you get a compile client Java task. So all of that stuff you get out of the box just by declaring a new source set. So, and you, you basically think of source sets by understanding your build, uh, what's in it, what it's trying to produce. Um, and I did mention this, uh, do make sure wherever possible to bring your custom tasks into the incremental build system. Uh, plugins. Okay, so uh, it's very easy to use existing plugins. And they are also a great way to encapsulate your own conventions. So remember, like the directory structure for Java projects is a convention. Uh, you can encapsulate your own types of things into your own plugins. Um, do, do use them to package common features across multiple projects. Really, you're, that's what you're gonna use plugins for, is when you have lots of projects across uh, a company or teams that have uh, similar requirements, similar deployment requirements, or uh, maybe they use Vagrant, you use Vagrant across all your projects. You want 
specific integration through custom tasks. Um, and that's an example of breaking your build file into smaller pieces. So a separate Gradle file applied from in the main parent. <coughs> okay, and the last of these is know your users. Users? We have users? Who? Well, there's you. You wrote the build file. Um, you've got that new guy who just started. Uh, do you really want him deploying the application to production? Um, do you want him to have access to all the really dirty secrets in your build file, all those tasks that don't run this unless you really know what you're doing type tasks? Uh, a build file often has many stakeholders. <coughs> so, ask yourself, do you only have one type of user? If yes, you don't really need to do much. Um, but I, they, uh, example for me is I have my open source Lazy Bones project. I have people that want to collaborate, provide pull requests. They want to use the build to locally install the application so they can test their changes. <coughs> but I don't want them publishing it. That's me. That's my responsibility. Um, in fact, I don't restrict them from doing it, but I'll, I'll show you what I, I do do. Um, so, but think about which parts of the build should be accessible. Uh, what sort of tasks should be most visible to different types of user? Uh, I gather it has been known for people to put access control in their build files. So, dumb developers who aren't supposed to do anything except run the compile and uh, jar maybe, all they can see are the compile and jar tasks. Okay? That's the kind of thing that you can incorporate into your build. Um, and you know, what do they want from the build itself? So, just one small example. Uh, as I said, it's a normal Java project, but only the project lead should publish. The publication requires credentials. Now, I want the build, you know, when I'm publishing, I don't want to have to wait until all the integration tests have run. Because the integration tests take a little bit of time, they take several minutes. I don't want to wait till they finish to then find out that I got the credentials wrong for the publication. Or I forgot to add them, the build can't find them. It's like, that's all you need. Ten minutes, yeah, nearly that. Oh. So. What I do is hook into the task graph itself. Now I can say, when the task graph is complete, so this is right at the end of the configuration phase, um, Gradle knows exactly what is going to execute. I can ask the graph, so are you running that upload disk task? If yes, then check that the credentials are there. So this means that when I'm publishing, it fails fast. But if a, uh, one of my collaborators, who are few and far between, unfortunately, I'm happy to accept more if anyone wants to give it a try. Um, if they grab the code and just want to install it locally, they don't have to have these credentials in place. So other things that you might want to consider, including class obfuscation conditionally depending on whether it's going to a customer or not, or it's going into an installer. Uh, again, limiting visibility of tasks based on role. That was that access control I was talking about. Um, and one of the earliest examples I was introduced to was uh, update the version uh, based on whether there's a release task in the graph. So the version doesn't change unless you're actually releasing. So this is the kind of information about the build that you can get within the build itself and use it to enable your build process. So, uh, in summary, understand the Gradle model, the project, the tasks, configurations, dependencies, source sets, and how they all fit together. Trust me, source sets are amazing. I have not done them justice here. But 
you can pull out their class path. Uh, it, you, can, you can find out their runtime class path, i.e. what dependencies they, they require. You can just query it for where the classes have been compiled to. And then you can just change what the source set is and your whole build just continues to work. Um, they, they, they're fantastic, seriously. I can't oversell them. Uh, always, just with your own projects, your software projects, keep refactoring as required. Don't let your build files accrete into horrible messes of uh, task instances, task left shift, boom, 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 because they won't be easy to understand. Factor them out into build SRC, uh, consider going for plugins. If you're seeing repeated bits of code, think about pulling that out into a plugin and saying this is a convention. You know, I will have, this is where, uh, this is the types of resources that I include in these processes. Uh, this is what I do with those types of files. Um, understand your build and know your users. So those four, keeping those in mind, will ensure that you uh, stay on top of your builds. Okay? And uh, some earlier, you know, remember IOC is an important one as well. Make sure that you inject values into tasks. Don't pull them from the environment. Okay? So, thank you very much. I really do hope that eases your way into Gradle um, because it is a very powerful tool. It can be intimidating. Um, you can do amazing things with it, including shooting yourself in the foot, as I said in one of my blog posts. Um, so, yes. And at the end of that blog post, I said, you have the power to do what you need and shoot yourself in the foot. Be responsible. That's the only thing you can do. Okay, uh, any questions? Have I exhausted you for the evening? Everyone's <laughs> going to get a good night's sleep. You didn't yes. mention uh, Gradle Wrapper, which is very useful. Uh... Yes, so um, Gradle Wrapper. <coughs> uh, there is a, every Gradle project has an implicit task called Gradle Wrapper. When you run it, it produces a script file, a jar file, and it's a it's a batch file and a script file, so it works on Windows and Unix. It's in your project directory. You can execute it, and it will ensure that your build runs with the version of Gradle that your build is designed to work with. You don't have to have Gradle installed. The Gradle wrapper will pull it from the internet. You do need an internet connection, but it just pulls it from the internet and runs it. This is great for continuous integration servers that don't know about Gradle. You just say run dot slash Gradle W and then what other task you want. Um, it's, it's great, yeah, Grail's picked up that idea. Um, it makes your build independent of having specific tooling available other than the JDK, well the JDM, you, you still need the JDM installed. Uh, was there another question? What about the uh, IDE support? So the IDE support um, is, uh, actually I can't compare it to the Maven, I heard that the Maven support was terrible for a long time, but I hear it's much better now, but I don't know for sure. Um, it's, it's, it is very good, uh, you get all the syntax highlighting, uh, if you have, uh, they both like Eclipse, I know Eclipse and IntelliJ better than NetBeans, um, but they both support the Gradle wrapper. IntelliJ has a really nice feature that if you get Gradle all, it will give you auto-completion for your Gradle build files. So it knows that when you type project dot, it knows you've got a project object there. Um, and uh, if you see the tasks are available, you can run the tasks from within your build system. Uh, Gradle itself has a tooling API. It's an access point into the system specifically designed for IDEs. So uh, it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it's, it's very good. And another thing to bear in mind is that Android Studio is based on IntelliJ. And Android Studio is designed to work with Gradle. So they are rapidly improving IntelliJ support. Um, 
Eclipse is pretty solid, but I think it's now always going to trail behind IntelliJ simply because of Android Studio. Yeah. When porting a builder from uh, Eclipse to Do you have uh, things for, for Maven, for instance, you can run on task. Can you do the same in Maven, in Gradle? In Gradle. So, the question is, can you, um, well, migrating from um, Ant and Maven. So, uh, I didn't have uh, an example. Do I have an example? Uh, my sign jar example. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where this is dot, dot, dot. There's an ant object that I use to invoke ant.signjar. That invokes the ant task. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if you know Groovy at all, but uh, Groovy has an ant builder object, uh, which you can use to invoke arbitrary ant tasks as long as they're on the class path. So the ant integration is like, amazingly straightforward. There's this ant property. You can access it from your custom tasks or from the build files. Uh, and then that just works. Uh, there is support for importing Maven projects, but I'm not quite sure what the status of that is. Um, I don't know how well it works. Uh, but that, that should at least give you a starting point. But Maven has a very different view of the world to Gradle, so um, I'd be tempted to just say, Start, you know, start from fresh. But import from Maven is uh, is an option there. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Yes, I have one more. Uh, you you talked about plugins. In which ones are worthwhile uh, looking at? Or... Uh, well, so <coughs> all the core ones. So Gradle itself comes with a whole bunch. Uh, things like PMD, uh, check style for static analysis, uh, Tomcat and Jetty for if you have a, a web application for running. The, um, it, they give you a run task for actually starting up an embedded server. Uh, the Shadow plugin is nice for creating a, um, a, a fat jar. So it pulls all the dependencies into a single executable jar file. Uh, very popular amongst microservices crowd. Uh, there are, uh, it depends what you want to integrate with. Uh, Gradle has an Eclipse and Idea plugins as well. They will generate corresponding project files for you. Uh, because um, there was a question about IDE integration. Uh, I said it was pretty solid, but Gradle has a much richer concept of what a project is. IDEs have a very, very simple view. You know, uh, I have my compile dependencies, I have my test dependencies, and that's about it, and then I have something to run. Um, you don't have that concept of separate source sets. You can do it with modules in IntelliJ, but um, uh, for many builds, it's still better to like run Gradle Idea or Gradle Eclipse to generate the project files to, to make sure they're configured properly. Um, the import import for Gradle is getting better though, so that will change. Um, uh, what else? There's a uh, release plugin uh, that's come out fairly recently. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but that's supposed to do something similar to the Maven release plugin. Uh, it's something that's been lacking. And uh, anyone like provided scope? Longest running and popular issues on the Gradle Jira is there's no provided scope. Gimme. Um, and they, the Gradle team, just don't. They want to do something a bit more complete. They don't like the concept of provided. But there are a couple of plugins. Uh, Spring provides one, and Netflix provides one. Netflix have a project, they call them Nebula plug plugins. So Netflix have done a lot of Gradle work. They have a, uh, a whole host of plugins that come under the name Nebula, Nebula plugins. And they have one for doing provided scope. They have a bunch doing other stuff, so they are well worth looking at. Yeah. Uh, 
as well. Um, but really, it's just the plugin pool tool has a search. If there's anything, a particular technology you want to integrate with, like sonar, then have a search for that. Okay? Anything I, you think I might have missed? Dependency exclusions, how is it, how is it uh, handled? <laughs> Dependency exclusions, so you can do that on uh, per dependency. You can say, uh, when you pull in a dependency, you say, but exclude this <laughs> dependency. Um, that's not recommended. Uh, it's better to uh, say, actually, for this configuration, for compile configuration, always exclude such and such a dependency. Uh, and, or use resolution strategy to fix a particular version or, or, or sort out those problems. Excluding on a per dependency basis uh, leaves you with kind of a bit of a mess in the dependency graph and something that's not that easy to maintain as dependencies change. So it depends what you're trying to achieve with that exclusion. And the Gradle guys basically say there are better ways to do what you want rather than use a per dependency exclusion. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Okay. Terminé? No? Uh, is there a way, uh, like in Maven, uh, uh, from parent, a way to, to have uh, some common, uh, common things that apply to several projects? Uh, yes. So um, uh, I'll see whether I can get into my home directory. Uh, but yeah, but it's but rather that it's actually Maven doesn't do uh, POM inheritance really now, does it? They, they use a different. They prefer a different approach. Uh, Gradle goes with um, configuration injection. So. You have a root project, your build.gradle, and then uh, a sub. Yeah, that's not going to work. Uh, there are a couple of blocks you can use all projects and sub projects. Everything in there will be applied to all the sub projects. You can even uh, specify which projects you want that common configuration to apply to. Yeah. There is a downside to that. Uh, gradle supports parallel project execution so that you can run like compilations for two different projects at the same time uh, if you've got multiple cores. And who doesn't have multiple cores now? Everyone does. Um, as soon as you use configuration injection like that, you've tied your projects together, you can't run them in parallel. But that's a that's standard approach. Um, let me see, can you project uh, dev, projects, uh, I appear to. Oh, right. That's because I need to. Yeah. Uh, this is a very, very simple one. Uh, <coughs> Apples used to be easier to use. There we go. So, this is in the root project. You have a block like that, and you can apply plugins, you can create uh, project properties, you can specify repositories. Anything that you can do within build.gradle, you can do within an all projects or sub projects block. And if you want an example of how far it can be taken, the Gradle build itself uh, uses that heavily. I'd say actually the Gradle build is one of those where people look at it and go, wow, how the hell am I supposed to understand that? But it's very, very rich. They, they want their build to do a lot of stuff. Um, but they, they have structured it fairly, uh, pretty well. If you go into individual Gradle files, they're, they're fairly straightforward. But, you know, they're, they're testing. Their testing stuff is fairly complex because it's, it's the nature of the problem is complex. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'll let you get back to your bill, uh, beds, bills. Beds, bills and beds, thank you.